Good afternoon and welcome to this lecture in celebration of awarding the first George Hunt Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters. I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon. This initiative began with the creative suggestion of Faye Vincent, who has been a longtime member of this Board of Trustees. Faye wanted to honor his friend, George Hunt, and I have been a reader of George Hunt over many, many years, and it was easy for him to convince me of this, in, in, this initiative. Uh, I've been delighted to work with Father Malone from America and the selection committee, especially the two from St. Thomas More, Kathy Caveney from Boston College, uh, and uh, Maura Ryan from Notre Dame. I thank them for their time and effort in making this selection. Again, welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce Father Matt Malone, President and Editor-in-Chief of American Media. Uh, my brothers and sisters, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, this evening to celebrate the, uh, the inaugural uh, award of the George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Journalism, Arts, and Letters. Uh, which is really an effort to recognize the finest literary work of Roman Catholic, uh, well, of intelligence and imagination uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, I thought I would just start with a word about George Hunt, um, who was, as Father Boulogne indicated, uh, a great friend of Faye Vincent, uh, without whose generosity we would not be here this evening. Um, Father Hunt was also the, the, the longest tenured editor-in-chief in, in America's history. Um, he had a passion for excellence and uh, a keen eye for uh, young talent, particularly the very finest writers, uh, both in the, in the Catholic and secular worlds. Uh, he was the 11th editor-in-chief of America. He earned a theology degree from Yale Divinity School in 1970, later remarking that his decision to study Kierkegaard uh, here at Yale was the best and most fruitful decision in my entire academic life or it set the stage for a lifelong study of the literary arts. After receiving his PhD in literature, Father Hunt joined the staff of America in 1981 as the Review's literary editor, a position, he said, that provided the ideal situation to read more widely and deeply. And Father Hunt's voracious appetite for the written word, he would often read three books in a single week afforded him a deeply sophisticated knowledge of a broad range of literary and cultural topics. As Mr. Vincent uh, later remarked uh, at the time of uh, George's passing, over the years, George demonstrated to me that he knew more than just about anyone alive about football and baseball, jazz, the movies, modern fiction, especially Cheever and Updike, the Civil War, political history, Winston Churchill, Irish history, <laughs> Tammany Hall and Mayor Tweed, military history, especially World War II, and the list goes on and on. In addition to his hundreds of columns and reviews for America, as well as dozens of lectures and scholarly articles, Father Hunt was the author of book-length works of biography and literary criticism, including John Cheever, The Hobgoblin Company of Love, and John Updike, and The Three Great Secret Things, Sex, Religion, and Art. Jesuit author James Martin, the editor-at-large of America, has remarked that Cheever, Updike, and Hunt shared, quote, something in common in terms of their writing styles, clear sentences and a masterful command of English grammar and vocabulary, graceful, elegant, and measured. He retired as editor-in-chief in 1998 at the conclusion of the magazine's most successful year to date. Uh, as both the president and editor-in-chief, <laughs> I appreciate the history of the man who left us in the black, uh, as well as with a much enlarged reputation. He uh, became the, arch uh, the director of the Archbishop Hughes Institute for Religion and Culture at Fordham University, where he dedicated himself to exploring the relationships between religion and other aspects of contemporary life. And George Hunt died in 2011 at the age of 74. As I said, he was a great friend of many in the literary world. Uh, he was a great fr friend of Mr. Vincent's. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to memorialize George in this way. Uh, and so when we went about uh, putting together the criteria for this prize, we, we really established criteria that came from George's own body of work. Um, and they were fairly rigorous. 
George was a bit of a taskmaster when he, as an editor, um, and he demanded precision as well as grace and beauty and eloquence. Um, tonight's winner uh, was selected out of over 200 nominations submitted from places around the world, uh, the Middle East, parts of Europe, and Canada. Uh, the, Prunt, the Hunt Prize Selection Committee comprised of esteemed professors, writers, and poets from across the United States gathered uh, earlier this year to review those nominations. It was not an easy task. Um, and uh, I would also like to add my thanks to the two folks who represented America on that uh, review committee. Uh, Kevin Spinelli, who is here with us tonight, uh, who is a Jesuit and missioned in Boston, and Angela Lemo O'Donnell, who is a poet and professor at, at Fordham University. Dr. Philip Metris is professor of English at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio, and he is internationally recognized for his contributions to poetry. His writings have been translated into numerous languages, and his work clearly displays a deep appreciation for his craft and is informed by a social consciousness that moves the heart as well as the mind. We sent uh, our executive editor of America Films, Father Jeremy Zippel, to Cleveland to interview Dr. Metris and provide this video profile uh, before Dr. Metris is awarded the prize and delivers his lecture. I wonder if Father Boulogne, you'd like to join me? So on behalf of the trustees of the St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale University and the trustees of America Media, uh, we are pleased to present to Philip Metris III the inaugural George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters. I'm so mad at Jeremy Zippel right now for that film. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. I have a lot of people to thank first. I'd, I'd like to thank the Hunt Prize Committee um, and Faye Vincent uh, for, choosing, for choosing me as their inaugural recipient. It's, it's overwhelming. Thanks in particular to Father Malone, Jeremy for that film, Joe Hoover for uh, interviewing me. Um, Nick Sawicki for running the log logistics, Kara Walker as well, and for, uh, to Father Bob, Bob Beloyne for hosting us here and driving me hither and thither this afternoon as we were trying to find a, a certain uh, class to be teaching uh, today. I'd like also to thank uh, Paul Lauritsen, who's in the audience, who is my colleague at John Carroll University, um, renowned ethicist, at, who nominated me um, out of the goodness of his heart and uh, I think probably his letter had something to do with the fact that I'm here, as well as my colleague, Jamie Steyer, Gene Collar, and, and my mentor, Bob Cording, uh, a renowned poet uh, from Holy Cross, who was a, a, a great mentor to me and a good friend now. I'd like also to thank my wife, Amy, for her companionship on our journey together and um, for these great kids that we uh, have brought into the world. I'd like also to thank my parents who are here for their sacrifice and love. Um, is Chris Dusso here? Um, I wanted to thank Chris Dusso, who's actually in the Hartford. Uh, Hartford, he's he runs the Catholic Worker House there, and the, just um, for reminding me and reminding us uh, what it means to live the gospel daily. And of course, I'll thank God, the God of abundance and, and love and joy for, for bringing me here, but also for bringing all of you here as well. I'm totally overwhelmed, and I'm supposed to give a talk now. <laughs> so this talk is called Homing in the Place of Poetry in the Global Digital Age. 
And I wanted to think about the predicament in which we find ourselves um, in this global age, in an age increasingly which is digital, and what poetry, what role poetry might play in this landscape of um, great distraction and attenuation of, of subjectivity and, and also connectedness at the same time, and what, how the arts might play a role in grounding us. So that, that's where this came out of the question that, you know, what, what can poetry do? Why does poetry still matter? And I'd like to start with an anecdote. Um, actually, I'm going to start with an anecdote before the anecdote in the essay, which is frequently in my class, I, I teach at a table, the creative writing class around a table, and I'll see students going like this. <laughs> and it looks exactly like they're praying, but they're checking their cell phones. <laughs> Praying to the digital God. My dad always texts me right before class. You know, they put it away. So I'm thinking about that. What, what is it about this device that we have that looks like prayer? My wife and I went shopping for smartphones recently, beholding these modern votives with equal parts wonder and vexation. We digital immig immigrants and introverts who tote a decade-old flip phone only for emergencies See the benefits of these magical devices. They have the fairy tale power of a digital genie released from the mere swipe of a screen. But what will the genie, what genie will we release, unleash when we bring technology into our lives? Doesn't the servant in the end always change the master? Despite the fact that digital technologies offer us global connectedness, they also appear to isolate us further into our own self-created reality dislocate us from the non-digital world. And the greater our privilege, the more we can cordon off the real, the stronger our myopia. As Amiri Baraka once wrote, luxury then is a way of being ignorant comfortably. Yet privilege does more than damage our vision, it starves the heart. In the biblical parable of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man's flaw is not merely being unable to see Lazarus in pain right outside his gate. After his death, when the rich man looks up from Hades, he clearly recognizes Lazarus next to Abraham in heaven and begs Abraham to ask Lazarus for a bit of water to cool his torment. The rich man knows Lazarus by name, but even in hell does not see fit to address him directly. In our global digital age, with its information flood, its attenuation of, of attention, its transmogrification of subjectivity, its obscuring of our connectedness, what can poetry and the arts do? The artist's challenge is not merely to chronicle the hectic present, but to develop an understanding of how we find ourselves at this time and place, to explore what binds us to each other, and to ask Leo Tolstoy's question, how then shall we live? Poetry's oldest and least marketable power, paradoxically, offers us a secret vitality. Poetry's slowness, its ruminativity, enables us to step back from the distracted and distracting present, to ground ourselves again through language in the realities of our bodies and spirits, and their connections to the ecosystems um, in which we find ourselves. The form of a poem itself is one that forms us, holding us in its thrall. To dwell with singular lines or phrases, lines that puzzle or clarify, carries us back to the ancient practices of ritual chant and shamanic trance, fundamental to the ecstatic possibilities of communion and healing. In the words of C.D. Wright, some of us do not read or write particularly for pleasure or instruction, but to be changed, healed, charged. Poetry at its root is a making, poesis. This making, making is often akin to prayer, a reaching for or an appeal to the great mystery of the beloved, the great maker. One of the things I love about Ignatian spirituality is its emphasis on an active imagination, what St. Ignatius calls composition, often translated as seeing in imagination or mental representation. Composition comes from the Latin, meaning putting together or connecting, but the word's roots also suggest that imaginative visualization involves placing oneself with. The imagination can locate us in our own lives 
what Ignatius calls the daily examine, as well as bring us to far-flung places to stand and be with others. Ignatius asks the exercitant, for example, in contemplating the nativity to see in imagination the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, consider its length, its breadth, whether level or through valleys or over hills, observe the place where Christ is born, whether big or little, high or low, and how it is arranged. Such grounded visionary practice is both exercise and meditation. The work of the imagination invites us to slow down, to pay attention, to visualize, and to wonder. Poetry tunes us to ultimate things. Poetry is not a mere throwback, some atavistic practice for the vestigial few. On the contrary, poetry's discipline of entering us into our minds and bodies, our restless bodies, our roiled souls, is an ancient practice that invites grace to enter our brokenness, to hold us together, to waken us again. The Sufi poet Rumi wrote, The wound is the place where light enters you. 700 years before Leonard Cohen sang, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Thus proving Thomas Merton's thesis that that which is oldest is most new. Now here's another argument for poetry. Poetry is also a technology of embodied inquiry, a way of locating ourselves and others within contexts that were heretofore outside of our understanding. Michael Davidson has proposed that perhaps poetry in its proximity to affective states is the dream work of globalization. Poetry and the arts indeed can help us perform what Frederick Jameson calls cognitive mapping. And this is his his, uh, definition, enabling a situational representation on the part of the individual subject to that vaster and properly unrepresentable totality, which is the ensemble of society's structures as a whole. All right, I have to admit, I love this strange quote. Jameson, a postmodern Marxist theorist, has in mind a materialist totality and that we are subjects and objects in the system of late capitalism. Yet Jameson's phrasing is mystical, inviting us to consider not only human structures, but also planetary cosmic structures, perhaps even the unrepresentable divine. So the poetry that I am trying to write and that I'm interested in, the arts I'm trying to um, advocate for, is what I would call cosmopoetics. Cosmopoetics might be a way to describe art that performs this cognitive mapping. It suggests both both cosmopolitanism, the philosophy of global human solidarity, and also something cosmic where the universe offers us traces of a great totality. When I look at my own writing, which began only as a blind reaching out into the epistemological dark, A cosmopoetics, a geographical imagination, seems to have taken shape. Like many writers, I began writing to make sense of what was happening to me and around me. As my interests have have orbited further outward, I was challenged, and the language challenged me to reach beyond comfortable frames of understanding. Each place became a portal to new worlds. Traveling to my grandparents' houses in Brooklyn or Rhode Island or climbing inside the ancient steppe pyramid at Chichen Itza in Mexico, or after college living in Russia for a year, or visiting my sister in Palestine, were quantum leaps where my language flailed to reach for some sort of handhold. The questions of travel, as Elizabeth Bishop called them, have often been at the center of my writing. Travel exposes us to otherness, other cultures, other histories, other people, and exposes us as other to ourselves. Yet, as Mary Louise Pratt has argued, the trope of anti-conquest in Western travel writing, in which an innocent Westerner encounters other places and cultures, can become a strategy of representation that enables one to, quote, seek to secure their innocence at the same moment as they assert European hegemony. So many writers have, so many writers have exploited their travel experience as yet another subject to plunder, the imagination as a marauding imperial Columbus. That's why in one poem in To See the Earth, I cite my Russian mentor, Dmitry Psertsev, who once remarked after reading some of my poems, this is your version of Russia, not Russia. (laughs) (laughs) When I speak of cognitive mapping, I'm talking about an essential human endeavor to connect our physicality and our psyches to our surroundings. And it's a bit of a dirty little secret, but Father Boulogne actually witnessed it 
I do love getting lost <laughs> because getting lost also entails a new kind of knowing. Just when you think you know where you're going, you're lost. When you see you're lost, you're going to find something, something larger than yourself. Yet cartography and its abstractions are deeply political and have often extended exploitative power arrangements, carved people and peoples apart from the aims of empires. That's why I'm wary of broad claims about the represent representativity of my representations. So, you know, to see the earth as my creation story, pictures at an ex exhibition as my Russia, Concordance of Leaves as my Palestine, Sand Opera as my Iraq. Or rather, this is where I come from. This is the Russia in which I lost and found myself, the Palestine that absorbs me, the Iraq that carries me. Sand opera actually began as a daily Lenten meditation, working with the testimonies of the tortured at Abu Ghraib to witness to their suffering. It's become an attempt to find a language that would render visible and to locate the war itself constantly off screen. War is so distant that the closest most Americans get to is when they encounter a veteran or a refugee. That it was illegal for 18 years from 1991's Operation Desert Storm until 2009 to take photos of flag-draped coffins of U.S. military suggests a level of censorship during war we need to recognize. This policy is designed not only to abstract the enemy, but also to render the cost of war invisible and suppress domestic questioning. More recently, our contemporary program of targeted assassination by drones has yet to be made fully apparent to the American people. My desire in sand opera is to make the Iraq war and the wider war on ter uh, terror visible, to make a visible and audible map of it, a map that we could carry in our ears and eyes, in our bodies and hearts, to replace the maps of pundits and demagogues. As a poet, I wanted to do this mostly through language, often through language which renders the ruptures of violence, through the black bars of redaction and fractured syntax. But I also found myself drawn to the strange images that point toward the operations of war, some of which you saw in the film. Throughout the book, for example, unexplained drawings of rooms appear uh, with language floating on a vellum page above them. These are the renderings of Mohammed Bashmila, a former prisoner from Yemen, of what have come to be known as black sites, secret prisons where the U.S. and its allies would illegally hold and interrogate detainees. These drawings are renderings of one who's been rendered, sundered from everything he knew. To witness them is to enter the mind of a person utterly dislocated, yet rigorously, obsessively trying to locate himself. Sand Opera also contains a diagram of a proper Muslim burial from the standard operating procedure manual from the Guantanamo Bay prison. The manual notes the importance of the treatment of the body, the enshrouding process, the prayers that should be uttered, and how the body should point toward Mecca. Alongside the testimonies of prisoners who saw the Quran thrown into the toilet, we are struck again by the gap between our measure of cultural sensitivity and our manipulation of that knowledge for cruel and degrading acts. A poem is a momentary home, a way to home in. Their architectures, their forms, inform how we perceive and feel insides and outsides. In sand opera, we stumble among the broken syntax of the tortured in Abu Ghraib prison, stare at the thick walls of a vellum-paged black site, trying to read the words of, on the next page seeping around the prison cell. We confront the words of a bereaved widow of a soldier who has the chance to enter the military tank where her husband died. Uh, in Home Sweet Home, nested inside another poem based on a letter of a Marine lamenting his own entrapment in a war where he can't fight the evil he faces. War always comes home, not just in the bodies and minds of military veterans, but also in the militarization of prisons and police. The distance between Ferguson and Baghdad is closer than some might want to think. Cosmopoetics is ultimately not just about mapping or even seeing. It's about listening about the radical vulnerability to the other. As Isaiah writes, morning after morning, he opens my ear, it's my ear that I may hear. Sand opera is the sound of my listening. These poems carry forth voices that have opened me. The Iraqi curator, Donnie Georgiouhanna, sharing slides of lost art from his cherished museum. 
abused Iraqi prisoners and U.S. military at the Abu Ghraib prison, a recipe from our friend Nawal Nasrallah's Iraqi cookbook, the detained Mohammed Bashmila, a drone operator who isn't sure who he's killing, an Arab American living through the paranoid days after the 9-11 attacks, and my daughter's coming to consciousness in a world where war leaks through the radio and television. I find the sand opera is the sound of my listening just funny right now because I was on a plane earlier today and having a cold, my ears are entirely blocked. So I don't even know if I'm speaking loud enough. Am I speaking loud enough? Okay, good. All right. Uh, the words of my daughter at the end of the poem hung liars embody what I hope I can continue to open myself into. What does it mean, I say? She says, it means to be quiet just by yourself. She says, there's a treasure chest inside. You get to dig it out. Somehow it's spring. Says, will it always rain? In some countries I say they are praying for rain. She asked, why do birds sing? In the dream, my notebook dipped in water, all the writing lost. Says, read the story again. But which one? That which diverts the mind is poetry. Says, you know those planes that hit those buildings? Asks, why do birds sing? When the storm ends, she stops, holds her hands together, closes her eyes. What are you doing? I'm praying for the dead worms, says, listen. How can we map these connections and distances without losing focus on what's directly in front of us? This tendency toward hyperopia, that long-sightedness, which is also a kind of myopia. I've thought a lot about the ways that my obsessions with distant wars and places and people have frayed me to loose ends, distracting me from intimate joys and domestic peace. At times I've wondered if I've engaged in the poetic equivalent of the father scrolling through his phone while his child finally balances on her bike and glides down the sidewalk in perfect rhythm with herself and her conveyance. How to hold the sight of my daughter's faces dearer to me than any faces on this dear earth alongside the sight of someone else's daughter's face, first seen on Facebook, pulling school books out of a bombed house in Gaza to continue studying another day. How to hold and be held by my beloved wife and also teach my classes, catch up on emails and messages, mow the lawn, take out the garbage, and also find time to click a microloan to a Gazan farmer named Ahmad who needs to buy some hens for his egg business. How do we carry our others and ourselves on this fragile planet? Antonio Gramsci once asked himself so poignantly, is it really possible to forge links with a mass of people when one has never had strong feelings for anyone, not even one's own parents, if it is possible to have a collectivity when one has not been deeply loved oneself by individual human creatures? Hasn't this tended to make me sterile and reduce my quality as a revolutionary by making everything a matter of pure intellect, pure mathematical calculation? Gramsci's question is an old theme, as old as Diogenes' idea of cosmopolitanism. The cosmopolitan idea that we are all connected and that a person on a distant part of the globe is as dear as our neighbor has always engendered the profoundest critique of the cosmopolite, that he's one who loves everyone in the abstract but hates or ignores all particular people. It's a real danger I have occasionally blundered into, blinkered by vanity or distracted by novelty. Poetry is one of the ways we might try to home in, to claim our ground. Not our digital platforms with the raw earthiness of our own bodies, our beloveds, our kin, our distant next door, human and sentient neighbors of the communities in which we live and ones to which we're tied. Like any technology, poetry contains powers that both distract and focus us. It is a danger like any power. And it is one of the ways I answer the question, how to ground myself in my own body, my breath, exercising something I have for no other word for but love, that radical opening of the self to the other. Now, of course, I, I was teaching a class today with Christian Wyman, a, a great poet and thinker, and I was thinking, of course, you know, the, the work of poetry for me has always been a parallel kind of labor to the work of prayer. And maybe in some sense, one of the things that's always drawn me to it is the longing for a language that might be commensurate to my own longings and my own desires to speak to the beloved, to the great maker, to God. 
For we are put on this earth a little space, William Blake writes, that we may learn to bear the beams of love. So I'd like to circle back to that smartphone for, for a moment. I'm as implicated as everyone. As soon as the new iPhone comes out, we will finally break our digital immigrancy. <laughs> it's strange to think that the very smartphone that enables us to Google map our way in any strange city doesn't advertise that the rare earths that go into its construction, elements such as tantalum, tungsten, tin, and gold, may have come from or fueled conflict in places such as the Congo. And once a new model emerges and we've worn out the phone, where does this material go when we've thrown it out? Whose child will be paid pennies to pull out its innards? And who will inherit its poisons? I trace my awakening to this question from my early days at Loyola Academy in Wilmette, Illinois, where in a freshman religious studies class taught by the improbably ancient Father Stenkin, he was probably about 50, but for me he was <laughs> Methuselah, we watched The Wrath of Grapes, a documentary expose on pesticide exposure to migrant workers, and the filmic adaptation of Ambrose Bierce's Occurrence at Owl Street Bridge. Ignatian spirituality, from social justice conscientization to existential exploration of a condemned man's longing for freedom, lit my imag imagination and dilated my empathy. What I long to write and encounter is art that can help us make a quantum leap in our moral imagination. As a poet and as a person, I long for Isaiah's fire, for a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary a word that will rouse them. To make poems that will not only open our eyes, but awaken us, pry open our hearts and souls, induce metanoia, transforming how we spend our breath on this earth. And I'm just gonna end with a poem that's a prayer. It's called Compline, and in it you'll hear some echoes of Isaiah, also uh, our experience as a young couple dealing with a very colicky child, and thinking about where we meet God, which is in light and dark. Compline, that we await a blessed hope, and that we will be struck with great fear, like a baby taken into the night, that every boot, every improvised explosive, talon and hornet, Molotov and rubber-coated bullet, every unexploded cluster bomblet, every Kevlar and suicide vest, an unpiloted drone raining fire on wedding parties will be burned as fuel in the dark season, that we will learn the awful hunger of God the nerve-fraying cry of God, the curdy vomit of God, the soiled swaddle of God, the contented, this constant wakefulness of God, alongside the sweet scalp of God, the contented murmur of God, the limb-twitched dream-reaching of God. We're dizzy in every departure, limb lost. We cannot sleep in the wake of God, and God will not sleep the infant dream for long. We lift the blinds, look out into ink for light. My God, my God, open the spine, binding our sight. Thank you. I think the applause all speaks of our appreciation for your work. Uh, stay standing. Don't go. We're adjourning right now to the uh, dining hall. I just call your attention to two books, Behind the Lines, War Resistance Poetry on the American Home Front Since 1941, and Sand Opera. They are both available in the dining hall for purchase and for autograph. Again, thank you all for being here, and thank you for your wonderful contribution to this inaugural lecture. Thank you.